I've always taken the view that sat-nav is brilliant, but it's an aid to navigation. It's not the whole solution, if you like. One of the problems, I get this, I don't want to sound like an old person, but with young people I work with in television, they will get in a car having been given a location for a shoot, and they will simply put a postcode in a sat-nav, you know, something they got for 9.99 with 20 gallons of diesel or whatever, and then they will just blindly follow it without actually thinking, well, which part of the country am I going to? Um, should I be going west or should I be going north or whatever? They just believe it, and I don't entirely believe it because rubbish in, rubbish out. If you put the wrong postcode in, you only need to get one letter wrong. You could end up in a completely different bit of the country, and I've seen that happen. But also, more to the point, if you, if you only ever look at SatNav, which generally only has a screen this sort of big at best, then you're sort of looking at a map of the country down a down a tube, almost down a microscope, so you can only see a little bit of a you can see a little bit of the country at a time. Whereas if you have a quick look at a big map to start with, you know I'm in that bit of the country and I'm going over to that bit. So you get an overview, if you like, and you don't make those what the uh, aviators would call the gross error, where you actually head in the opposite direction by mistake. So I like maps, but I think SatNav is brilliant, especially if you're on your own and you're going to another town, um, and then you need to find a small street. And it's very difficult, young people won't even know this, but it is very difficult to drive a car or ride a motorcycle and keep looking at a map, especially as it's quite small, and if you're my age, your eyes are going as well, and so on. You have to keep stopping and looking at the map and remembering several turns, or scribbling it on a post-it note and sticking it on the dashboard or whatever. So SatNav is brilliant for that, but if I, if I set off, I live in London, so if I set off to go to, say, Edinburgh, and then find someone's house down a side street. I don't need the sat-nav to tell me how to get to Edinburgh. I know it's up the top of the country and I know basically which way to go. I don't need it to say, turn left at the end of your road and drive for 100 miles. I know that, obviously. It's moronic at that level. But at the other end, it's very helpful in simply helping me to find Kate's house. And people who blame sat-nav for things are saying, well, well, I've I know I've driven into the supermarket, but that's what it told me to do. It's only a machine. It doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have malice, it doesn't have an opinion. It's merely an algorithm and some colours on a screen. It's a suggestion, a bit like traffic lights in Italy. Doesn't mean you have to do it. I did get in a car with somebody from one of the production companies I work with, and I'd been away doing something else, and I'd flown back the night before very late, and I got up in the morning and they'd moved this shoot to that day. And I said, right, where are we going? And he says, oh, I've put it in the sat nav. And he'd put in a location that was in Bristol and we were actually going somewhere in Kent and he'd got it wrong. And I said, Do you need... I said, I thought we were going to Kent. And he says, oh, I don't know, we're just going to this post. And he, he didn't think, actually, where am I going? He just set off down the M4 and we would have gone to Bristol. And so I said, you must realize that that place is in Kent and Kent is not over there, it's, it's back there. But this blind faith in what is really, you know, a string of elaborate arithmetic it disturbs me. It's the surrender of our autonomy. Machines are great, but they are only machines. They are our servants, not our masters. I always have the voice off when I'm using SatNav. I, I can't really see the point of it speaking to me. Uh, particularly not if it's, you know, a comedy voice that you've downloaded and it's John Cleese or Jeremy Clarkson or whatever. I mean, why do you want... It's, it's only got about five jokes in it and they're all pretty lame and you've heard them 20 times by the end of one journey. Why would you want that? At the end of the road, turn left. Yeah, all right, I can see that on the picture. It's a map. It's very logical. The conventions have been established since oh, the, the early seafarers, or oh, if not before. And... Nobody knows what 200 metres is, anyway. And they also say stupid things, because again, it's just a series of phrases that are strung together according to an algorithm. It says things like, in Britain, it says, at the roundabout, take the third turning on the left. Now, in Britain, you can't turn off a roundabout on the right, otherwise you drive into the middle of the roundabout. So why does it say that? And a Mercedes once said to me, it assembled a series of phrases, I could see what it was doing. So it normally says, prepare to turn left, in 300 meters. But this one said, prepare to carry straight on ahead. Now I'm always prepared to carry straight on because that's generally what you do in a car unless there is something else to do. 
but it has the expression in its vocabulary, carry straight on, and it has the expression, prepare to, to introduce the next thing. But the next thing happened to be carry straight on, so it said prepare to carry straight on. Yeah, I was. I've never driven long and then suddenly stopped in the middle of a motorway because I don't know what to do next. Stupid. Get a map. Don't be a ponce. The weird thing about barcodes is they seem fantastically modern and incomprehensibly clever, but it's actually what the computer engineers would call a lot of simplicity. It is just the difference between black and white and the difference between naught and one. It's just a way of representing it. And it's actually been around a long time, since the 70s, and the research on it goes back to way before my birth. It's that old. But I've often thought it's strange that the, the next leap hasn't been made, which is that Obviously it's designed to make things quicker and, and more foolproof at a till in a shop, for example. But it hasn't developed to the point where the people who work in supermarkets can actually speak barcode. Because then somebody could be in the aisles and they could say, Hey Doris, have you got a space space bar space bar bar space bar 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 space space? And they say, oh yeah, it's on the third shelf down, the space bar bar space bar 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 space space shelf. And if you could do it very, very quickly, so that it just came out as a... You could give streams of information about groceries to each other in the space of a second or two and save a great deal of time. And you could also go up to an assistant in a shop and instead of saying, do you have any of those sweet potatoes that are quite popular in Jamaica and used in some of their rather spicy and interesting soups and, and uh, stews, you could just go up and say, excuse me, and they would know the answer and go, yes, sir, and then you'd know exactly where to go. And another thing I think would be quite interesting is if you got one of those very fine marker pens, something like 0.3 millimetres, and went around the supermarket and just minutely altered some bits of the barcode. Somebody might then go and buy a tin of tomato soup, but when it went through the scanner, it would say something like, uh, I don't know, kangaroo scrotum in tomato sauce. That'd be quite good. As long as it didn't change the price, it would be quite ethical. The, <laughs> the number five is bar bar space 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 bar. <laughs> is it bollocks? Hang on. I use self-checkouts in the supermarket because I can actually speak barcode, so I don't have to scan the individual things in front of that little window. I just take my basket up and hold it up and I go and the machine and it says, 13 pounds, please insert your card. Please take your items. I find the thing to do is to try and operate the machine, putting all your things in the bagging area, as they like to call it, and if you can get them in the bag and out of the door, before the machine says, thank you for shopping at whichever one it is, then you sort of earn a pound or something. Unexpected item in bagging area. Please seek assistance. Approval needed. Approval needed. Why can't they speak like normal human beings? It obviously is a human being in there. It isn't a synthesized voice. Someone has sat down in a voiceover studio or something a bit like this, really. And they said, OK, we need a line that says approval needed in case uh, it's an underage person buying a bottle of wine. So you'd say yes. Um, approvals needed for that, but somebody sat in a booth and went, Approval needed! Approval needed! Nobody speaks like that! Please place your items in the bagging area. Nobody refers to it as the bagging area. It's the bagging area. It's like Jeremy Clarkson's infected every single self-service checkout in the country. Please place your items in the bagging area. Please insert your card. Bollocks! Fags, gin, porn mags, that sort of thing. They always go, approval needed. Does your mother know? I don't really buy porn mags in the supermarket. I just look at it on the internet. Obviously, I'm from the 21st century. Can I go and have a smoke now? I'd like to say, for the record, that I hate energy-saving light bulbs. LED light bulbs are fantastic. All LED lights are great. They don't use much electricity. They're brilliant in torches, and they're going to be very good on cars and bikes and bicycles and so on. But the energy, the fluorescent energy saving ones that look like a series of sort of bendy tubes, they're rubbish because you put them in the bedside light and you think, oh, I'll get into bed and I'll read my book for a bit. And you turn it on and you just get this sort of faintly yellow urinary glow for what seems like about three quarters of an hour before it's actually bright enough to read your book. And by then you've fallen asleep. So actually they're causing me to be less well informed. I read less in bed than I used to because I can't wait for the light to warm up. And of course, if you said that to someone who had to read by candlelight with a sconce or by, you know, lighting a little 
gas burner or something, they'd say, oh, don't be so ridiculous. But, you know, things that are slow in the modern world are annoying. An internet connection that takes three seconds to work is infuriating. So a light bulb that takes three minutes to become bright is, is unacceptable. Get rid of them. How high do you think a light bulb is in man's greatest inventions? Well, I, the light bulb as an invention is brilliant, actually. It's... Although it, it, in itself the light bulb was a, almost a standalone invention, we did have light before that because apart from obviously gas lights and blazing torches held by Romans and so on, we did have things like electric arc lighting, but that couldn't really be used in the home. It was too complicated and too expensive and actually consumed a vast amount of electricity. Um, so the light bulb, the idea that you could simply press a switch, assuming you've developed the idea of mains electricity, obviously, but you press a switch and the place is lit up, must have made a massive difference to the world because prior to that, you'd have fiddly gas lighting, which wasn't very bright and burned your house down. And prior to that, candles, which is why I think the Victorians had so many ghost stories. Very occasionally when there is a power cut, you go into especially an old building that doesn't have particularly big windows, and you walk around with a candle if you haven't got a torch, and you know there could be somebody standing an arm's length away or so, and you wouldn't know they were there. So. You know, stories of murderers, spirits, the, the, the restless dead and Jacob Marley walking the earth with chains and all that. I can see how that grew up in an era with no easily made artificial light. So light bulbs are, yeah, cool. Except they're hot, obviously. Um, the subject of uh, changing light bulbs, are, mm. you, are you handy around the house? Yes, I'm quite handy around the house. I'm a reasonably practical man. I have a number of practical, dreary qualifications. The thing that's difficult about changing light bulbs around the house, I've even had a discussion about this on Twitter, nobody's come up with a very good solution apart from leaving a note, but is, the problem is, for example, recently, the, the what I still call the big light, the one hanging from the ceiling in my bedroom, broke. And my other half said to me, she said, oh, change the light bulb, you'll have to change the light bulb tomorrow, it's, it's broken. I said, yeah. But of course in the daylight you forget because you don't turn it on, because it's not dark. And then by the time it gets to night you press the switch and you think, oh no, the light bulb's broken. Well, I can't change it because it's dark, I can't see. So how do you... We need, a, we need a mechanism whereby there's half an hour of selective darkness in the middle of the day to remind you to change broken light bulbs before it gets to night time or write it on a piece of paper and stick it on the door. But you don't do that, do you, when it's time to go to bed? You think, oh, the light bulb's broke, oh, I'll mend it in the morning. But you don't. It's actually four months since it broke and I still haven't remembered to change it during the day. I'm assuming that the, the offensiveness of BO is a fairly recent social development because, as far as I can see, up until, well, probably the late 1970s, everybody had BO. They must have done. I did something quite interesting recently. I was making a documentary about the history of cars and I had to drive some 70s small family cars in Italy in July uh, in very strong sunshine. And of course those old cars, they didn't have air conditioning, they didn't have sun dim glass, they had uh, nylon, uh, no, vinyl seats and people back then would have worn nylon underpants. And honestly, within 10 minutes of being in this car on a sunny day in Italy, which is often sunny, I was just dripping with sweat. So everybody in the 70s must have had BO. Or they would have used a great deal of the sort of aerosol CFC-laden deodorants that we had at the time, which all smelled terrible anyway, because they smelled of, um, I don't know, Arctic forest or something like that. So I'm guessing that finding sweaty people offensive is, is a sensitivity we've developed quite recently otherwise humankind would have been so offended by itself it would never have reproduced and let's be honest this is gonna sound a bit pervy I suppose but fresh sweat is not an offensive smell it can actually be quite exciting without going into too many details it's old sweat and I think old sweat that is soaked into clothing that then gets stuffed in the bottom of a suitcase for a couple of days before you put it on again. That's what smells horrible, that sort of mouldy biscuit, slightly sort of damp dog smell that you get from overused clothing. That's unpleasant, but fresh sweat is, you get some very expensive French white wines that smell of fresh sweat and they're exciting to drink. 
there's a train going past now. It's a London tube train, so it's probably got upwards of a thousand people on it. This is the morning, so it's, yeah, 10 o'clock, still be quite busy. A goodly proportion of the people on that train will be a bit whiffy in one way or another, becoming more whiffy as they go along because the tube gets a bit hot and stuffy. But you can't, it's, it is very difficult to turn to somebody you don't know and say, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you smell like a Russian shop putter's box. Um, I don't know why we always say Russian shop putter there. I mean, why wouldn't it be a Scottish shop putter or a Welsh or English shop putter? It's just that the Russian shop putters are always very large people, I suppose. Um, what do you do? What do you do? There must be a technique for this. I hope you don't mind me saying, well, obviously they are going to mind you saying, that you smell really terrible. No one's going to take that as a compliment. And maybe I smell really terrible and everyone in here is just being too polite. You can tell me now, since we've done this, do I smell terrible? No, you're fine. You sure? Possible. Possible. I'm not aware that any of you, I'm not very close to any of you, but I don't think any of you stink. I use deodorant, but I, I do often feel when I'm putting it on, especially those, those ball type. I think, well, this isn't really natural, and it does feel like it's blocking you up. And we know, um, for example, in Goldfinger, in the James Bond film, when the woman is painted with the gold paint as a way of murdering her, when they did that for real, they had to leave a large patch on her back, unpainted, so that her skin could still breathe. Because actually, if you completely painted yourself so your skin was sealed off, it would kill you because you wouldn't be able to perspire at all, and you'd overheat and your skin chemistry would become corrupted and, and it would kill you quite quickly. So don't cover yourself in gold paint, or if you do, leave a patch for safety. Now pubs don't have smoke in them anymore. They do smell of sort of dead beer, fart, sweat, piss, all that sort of stuff. And it's, I liked it when it smelled a bit smoky and sort of Neanderthal. I think I've got a fairly sensitive nose. Oz Clark always says I do, and he knows about that sort of thing. So I can pick out, you know, different fruits and spices put in jars when I've got a blindfold on, and I can identify, you know, I often say, oh, something's getting too hot, it's burning, before other people who are standing near me smell it. So I think my nose is quite good. It's compensating for my appalling eyesight and terrible teeth. But I don't, um, I've never remembered a particular country or region as one that stinks. I've never said to somebody, oh, don't go to, uh, don't go to Germany, it's really smelly, because it isn't. <laughs> Sometimes it smells of uh, baking. They do a lot of baking in Germany, but apart from that, no. What does England smell of? Sweat. Does it smell of sweat? It smells of roses. Roses. <laughs> it's 20 bucks. It smells of bowler hats and cricket. <laughs> yeah, it smells of, yeah. People who have really massive televisions in the home Richard Hammond, for example, who famously has a really, really gigantic one. I always think that above a certain size, a television becomes vulgar. I say this as someone who's on it, but you know, it, it is a bit showy. And yet, if your television is too small, like the old portables we used to have when I was a student, that is too small, and that becomes annoying. So there is a sweet spot in the middle of the television size spectrum where a television is acceptable. And I think it's about that. The other problem is that, I mean, this isn't so true of plasma screens, but if you make a really big telly, you simply have to sit further back for it to look right. So why not have a small telly and move your chair a bit closer? When I was growing up, what did I like on television? Well, when I was very small, I liked the wooden tops, Pogel's Wood, Thunderbirds. And then later on, I liked Starsky and Hutch and all those other things like that. And then later on I liked The Persuaders and The Pretenders and Escape from Colditz and I liked the James Burke special and Tomorrow's World, the Oscar Peterson Piano Party. I, I, I liked the two Ronnies. The two Ronnies used to make me howl with laughter because they're just stupid. I liked Porridge and Open All Hours and related programs like that. And then later on I liked Alan Partridge and I used to laugh a lot at Howard's Way and that series called Campaign, which was about an advertising agency in the 80s, it was utterly nauseating, but it was so nauseating it was it was possessive almost in the, in the hold it had over you. And then these days I watch some arts programs, history stuff, documentaries, uh, and I listen to the radio quite a bit because I spend a lot of my time in my workshop because 
that's what happens, I'm afraid, when you get to my age. You find nice little jobs to do. That's what we do, people in our 50s. We do nice little jobs, and we spin them out, if we're honest. They could often be done in 10 minutes, but by messing up your little workshop, shed, garage, whatever, a bit, and, you know, having a radio and maybe a thing in there that makes tea, or maybe an old fridge with some beer in it, Wiring a plug can take weeks. Have you done that plug yet? Yes, I'm working on it. I'll just go ahead and do a bit more wiring the plug now. Bulletproof vests. They sort of sound like the stuff of fantasy because bullets will go through anything. They go through walls and cars and you know light armoured vehicles and all the rest of it. So how could you possibly stop them? But you can because of the way the bullet deforms. It's simply a, a way of managing energy. A bullet is a very light thing, but it goes very fast. So overall, it has a lot of energy. It's just mass times velocity. But if you can manage that and take it away and send it somewhere else and spread it around, then the bullet won't go through you. But I have spoken to people who have been hit by rifle rounds whilst wearing bulletproof vests or body armor, and they say even though it means you don't get killed or seriously wounded, it still hurts like hell. And the other thing that people forget is that if you're wearing the ceramic plate type body armor, when a bullet hits it, and the energy is dissipated through that, it becomes extremely hot. Because obviously the energy has to go somewhere. We know it can't just be destroyed. So all of the speed of the bullet, all its momentum, is converted into a hot spot. And some people have explained to me that they've been hit, but then they have to take the vest off very quickly because it's so hot it will actually burn them. You have to be very careful handling it as well. And you have to replace the sheets. They are one use only. What experience have you had with I have no personal experience of being shot in or not in a bulletproof vest. Well, bulletproof vest body armour is the issue. That is very heavy, but rifle rounds on the modern battlefield are extremely high. They're sort of three or f even four times as fast as some small handgun bullets. So just having folded fabric isn't enough. You do need the armour as well as the fabric arrangement, and then it does become heavy. There's no way around that. There is a belief that nanotechnology might be able to develop almost like a spider's silk material that will have fantastic properties for dissipating energy and spreading it out and deforming, but will be very light, at least as light as cotton, if not lighter. But we haven't got that yet. For the moment, soldiers and so on have to walk around effectively with great big roofing tiles stuck down their vests. It's pretty hard work. It is an arms race though, isn't it? Because if you make a better tank, you have to build a bigger tank to fight it with, with a bigger gun, so the shell will go through the armour, and so it goes on and on. If everybody agreed only to use air pistols, no, but we'd still have bulletproof vests, because then you'd think, aha, I'll protect myself against the air pistol, and the other bloke would build a bigger air pistol, and then somebody would make a proper cartridge, and then before you know it, you've got a field gun and a tank. It's the same thing, isn't it, as a handgun and a bulletproof vest. So a Superman suit? Well, yes, I suppose. Potentially, you could armour your whole body, not just this area. I mean, at the moment, you, soldiers tend to armour this bit, and the, the helmet has the armour in it as well. That's very heavy. You could cover your whole head, your legs, your arms, and everything, but it would be so heavy, unless you were immensely strong, I don't think you'd be able to move. Ned Kelly and his gang, their armour was reckoned to be about 45 kilograms. You know, they had like a bucket helmet and a big tube thing over their bodies. They could hardly move in those. It was one of the reasons why they were caught in the end. They couldn't run away in their armour. Knife-proof vests would have to be a fabric in a matrix that couldn't be penetrated by the point of the weapon, I would guess. But that was true to some extent of leather armour that Romans wore. That was sort of blade-proof, simply because it's very thick and very tough. That's why motorcycle riders wear leather. It takes a long time to wear through, and it's very slippery, so you slide down the road rather than tumbling, which would cause injury. It's still quite difficult to beat leather. There are modern Kevlar-based fabrics that have the same abrasion resistance as cowhide and kangaroo skin, but it's pretty difficult. Leather is fantastic. Um, I haven't done any jousting, I've done a little bit of sword fighting, but it was all cardboard armour and, you know, sort of pretend plastic swords, so it wasn't, there was no danger of death or serious injury. There was only really the danger of comedy, as you make a big thrust at someone and the sword just snaps in half. Or the word Kellogg's is revealed as a bit of paint comes off the cardboard.
I think the boomerang that you buy from the tourist shop at the airport in Australia is just a piece of wood with some stuff painted on it. I bet you it, it wouldn't do anything if you threw it. You'd have to make a boomerang. The, the shape would have to be quite, quite accurately worked out for it to work well, I think. You'd have to get the aerodynamic shape right. You'd have to get the taper on it. You'd probably have to have a little bit of washout, as they'd say in aeroplanes, a slight twist in the aerofoil so that one end stalled at a different speed from the other one. That's what aeroplane propellers do. They're not a constant twist all the way along. It changes and then it flattens out again towards the end because obviously the end is going faster than the middle, which is going faster than the route. So the physics of this sort of thing are quite complicated. The interesting thing about helicopters is one of the reasons their top speeds tend to be limited is that for the same reason that the boomerang turns. When a helicopter is going forwards, let's say the blades rotate that way, the blade on this side is going at its speed plus the air speed of the helicopter, the downwind blade, if you like, on this side is going at its air speed minus the speed of the helicopter. So it's having air taken away from it. And there will come a point where that side will stop producing lift and that side will produce all of it. And the helicopter can't go faster than that. And you get, once you get bigger blades, you run into problems because the ends are going so much faster. That's why you then have four blades or even five blades on a helicopter. And the same problem is true with aeroplane propellers. If they go beyond a certain rotational speed, the linear speed at the tip can become supersonic or transonic, certainly. That was a problem with the North American Harvard training aircraft. That's why it made such a terrible racket. The tips of the propeller were just starting to go transonic. So they had to make it slightly shorter and put a slightly bigger pitch on it. Can you think of anything that you'd throw away and want to come back? Things that you would throw away that you would want to get back. Well, I suppose <laughs> the world is full of people aged 50 and 60 plus who say, e, my grandma had thousands of those and she just threw them away. They usually say that when they're going around an antiques fair. But that's why these things are in antiques fairs and are collectible. It's because most of them were thrown away. If we kept it all, it wouldn't be interesting. We'd just be waiting to throw it away. So as a general rule, I think once you put something in the bin, you should accept that it's gone. Unless you're in my house, because some of the things that end up in the bin there are the car keys, the car registration document, money, aeroplane tickets, keys to the house, all sorts of stuff ends up in the bin for some reason. I've spent half my life emptying bin bags and searching for really, really precious things. I bought a new car. Don't want to digress too much, but I bought a new car a couple of years ago, quite a nice one. I was very excited about it. I brought it home and I put it in the garage. And about a week later, the you know the red V5 ownership document, the logbook, um, the pink papers. If you're a, an old-fashioned American, that arrived, and then it disappeared. And obviously, it's vital. It's not really your car without that piece of paper. And I looked for it, and I found it in the bin. We've also got a shredder. Imagine how dangerous that is. Well, firstly, there's a technical reason why trains are great. They're very big and they're very heavy. They take a very long time to accelerate and a very long time to stop. The physics involved is, is quite sort of awesome. It's a lot of mass and therefore a lot of energy. A big, long train can weigh, you know, 1,200 tonnes. That's, that's a lot of stuff. I think the other thing that's appealing about trains, the thing that makes them romantic, is a slightly more philosophical one. It's because if you go in a car or on a motorcycle or on a bicycle, Obviously, generally, you've got to stick to the roads, but you have a choice. You, you set off and you decide where you're going to go. When you get on the train, you submit to it because it has already been ordained where that train will go, even if you don't know where it's going, even if you're on a mystery excursion, and you have to give in to it. And there's something, there's something exciting about that. There's something almost sort of pioneering because it's slightly unknown. And the view from a car or from inside the helmet of your motorcycle is of things that are about to happen, things that are coming towards you. But on a train, you sit and you look out of the window at the side and your view is of things that have just passed, just occurred. So you're sort of looking at the past in a way as you go along, the very recent past, but the past nevertheless. It's as if the scene has been formed by the train and is pushed past it like the wake of a boat and it's something that wasn't there before. I think it's fascinating. I like trains a lot. I like watching trains. I know you shouldn't admit to that sort of thing because everybody goes, eh, Sando, train spotter. I don't mean I go and collect the numbers off them, you know, looking down over a bridge. 
It's just that when you see a train, it is exciting, isn't it? Is there anything that annoys you about a train journey? The thing that annoys me most about train journeys is that they don't actually go from and to where you live or where you want to be. I think that's the big disadvantage with them. That's why things like cars have triumphed. And the great irony is that people talk about intercity railways reducing congestion, taking goods off the road and so on, and that's all a very nice argument, but the real problem at the place where the congestion exists is the bit between where you live and the station, or between the goods yard and the supermarket that needs to be supplied, so the train doesn't actually answer that, unless you have railways running through the towns and cities, but in order to meet the sort of demand that's placed on cars, this railway network would have to be so complicated there'd be a station at everybody's house and there would be rails down every single road and that clearly can't happen it's too complicated but i think you know trains even in britain everybody goes oh the railways are so backward and underfunded and underdeveloped in britain and well maybe they are compared with bits of switzerland and france but they're still bloody fast i went on a train from london to york and it took about an hour and 35 minutes it went like the clappers it was at least twice as fast as the car. Cars, in reality, are actually pretty slow. They're just convenient. That is the truth. I know I shouldn't say that. I work on a car program. Cars are great fun. They're an interesting hobby. They're stimulating. They're exciting. But they're not a quick way of getting anywhere. Trains and light aircraft absolutely whoop their asses in every single way. But neither of them are convenient. You can't actually feel it, obviously, but you sense the enormous mass of a train. So I had a go at driving a steam locomotive that was pulling a big 12-coach train. And you have to, for those reasons we've just been talking about, the traction is on, you have to get it going very, very gingerly. You sort of squeeze the regulator and close it again and watch the pressure in the cylinders build and, and drop. And it, it actually creaks at first. It just goes, you know, you just about sense that it's moving and then it, it's just got enough grip and it goes uh, and it moves and you think that's fantastic it's just it's moving and it gets to about two miles an hour and then you feel that it's running away it's a strange sensation you suddenly panic and think shit now what so if you listen to the rolling stones performing they sing as americans they use american diction they use american syntax and they and they have american pronunciation but if you listen to them talking in an interview as people, then they have quite regional accents. That's true of a lot of rock stars. It's it's weird, really. There, there are affected accents. I mean, I still do it when I talk to the bank manager sometimes because I presume he's going to refuse me an overdraft or find some loan that I haven't paid off from 1985. It's the sort of linguistic equivalent of polishing your shoes and putting a tie on. It's pathetic, really. I mean, why can't we just be why can't we just be ourselves in it? A lot of people complain. I mean, this is we're not just talking about accents now, we're also talking about the, the sort of stylistics of language, I suppose. But I remember I was invited to take part in a debate, and I wish I had now, actually, on the radio, about the emergence of so-called Jafakan, which is this mixture of British English with certain idioms from the West Indies, you know, which is where we get a lot of in it and bruv from. And everybody's saying, oh, it's terrible because people aren't speaking properly. But it's, this has always happened. People muck around with the language and experiment with it because that's what makes it live and become rich. I'm sure all those people on the panel who were sitting there saying, it's disgraceful, if some Victorians could hear them speaking, they'd probably say they were disgraceful as well because it wasn't proper and they weren't pronouncing words properly and their sentence structure was shabby and flabby. It's all bollocks in it. It's blatant bollocks, totally. Now, yeah, accents, it's... <laughs> much as we try to deny it, there are some that we prefer. I like, I mean, I'll be brutally honest, I'm, I'm thinking really about the way women speak because how men speak isn't so important to me, but the women can seem much sexier with certain voices. I think, I think a very plummy, very educated, Indian, sort of, in, well, Asian, India, Pakistan and so on, that voice in a woman with those very rounded vowels that they have. I'm not going to attempt to do it because I'm used to the accent, but they have a very bubbly, very sort of overinflated sound to the words. I like that. I like Welsh as well, actually, proper hardcore Welsh from up the north. I think it's very melodic and very 
It's very sort of enchanting and mystical. Um, Borders Scottish voices are very nice in women. The, the woman, I'm brutally honest, she's electronic, but the one on the other end of the telephone banking system I use is so lovely. I can't, at the end where she says, thank you for calling, I can't put the phone down, even though I know she's actually just a computer. But she was a real woman once. She recorded all those phrases that are cleverly put together by a computer algorithm. She does exist somewhere, like Rapunzel locked in a digital tower, waiting be rescued. It's why the voices you can select in a sat nav are quite important. Some people will want the Irish voice, some people will want the northern one, some people want, will want the, you know, the old-fashioned plummy RP voice. I, I always turn the voice off on the sat nav. Doesn't matter who it is or where they've apparently come from, I still want them to meet an untimely death, so it's better not to have them there at all. I did a bit of linguistics when I was a student. I found it rather tedious, if I'm honest, but it was occasionally interesting. But I didn't know this theory that the ability to recognize tiny, tiny changes in the way people pronounce words is a sort of defense mechanism. So that whilst we were still tribal peoples and we never really went anywhere apart from maybe over the next hill, you would recognize if someone was an outsider, you would be wary of them. And I think this is still within us I can tell immediately I picked the telephone up that Richard Hammond is from Birmingham and therefore a potential threat. That's true. <laughs> I'm now 50 years old, so if I can just do some mental arithmetic, of which I'm very poor, that's 0.002% of 250,000 years, isn't it? Let's say it is. Insert another naught or take one out if I'm wrong. But that means. That means I'm so old that I actually, my, my lifespan is a significant measurable number in the entire evolution of the modern human species. I've made a significant contribution to it and its evolution. You can see that this is a face from an earlier type of modern human. It is a modern human, obviously, but it's not a very up-to-date human. It's a sort of, it's 1970s man. I've got a tool in my, it actually lives in the kitchen drawer rather than the toolbox and it's known as the most useful tool the world has ever seen. It's a, I suppose you'd call it a double-ended spatula. One end is square, the other end is pointed and then slightly tapered before the point and it's flexible and it has a thin handle in between the two ends and I think it was intended for probably putting putty in windows or something like that but then the flat end is very good for cleaning a particularly stubborn burnt bit out of the bottom of a frying pan and you find the pointy end is good for digging things out for crevices around the home. It is actually good for applying plaster and repairing small bits in the wall. It's flexible so that it makes things flat. It makes an amusing comedy noise when you bang it on the edge of the table. It is the most universal device, item, that humankind has come up with is it has more applications than any other one single thing that has no moving parts in it and quite a few that do. I mean a tin opener only opens tins. I've never found another use for it. The other end of the handle opens bottles, fair enough. But that has got two moving, three moving parts in it. This thing is just a shaped piece of metal and there is no job that it cannot accomplish in some way. So actually, if you had to send something out into space to say, this is what humanity meant, this is what it stood for, this was our achievement before we were wiped out by the nuclear holocaust or acid rain or, or an ice age or whatever, it's this. And other civilizations of supposedly superior intelligence will look at it and think, that's amazing. We've spent centuries and centuries developing all the things that make our society function. Actually, we just needed this bit of bent stainless steel. You can get them from B&Q, they cost about three quid. I'm terrible at heights. I've, I have been since I was a small child, but somebody explained it to me very well the other day. It's what we've just been talking about. They said, you're not actually scared of heights, you're scared of death, which I am. I will freely admit to that. The point is, when you're up something high, you can fall off and die. I mean, if you go to the top of the Empire State Building and you fall off of that, you're an absolute goner. And I think those of us who are scared of heights, in some way, have more imagination than people that aren't because they don't realize, they're too stupid to realize that if they make a mistake, they will be killed. Standing on a high building is a bit like pointing a loaded gun at your head and wondering if it's gonna go off. It could do. You might fall off and then you'll be dead. And that's, it's perfectly reasonable to fear that.
I'm not scared of flying. I fly light aircraft. I don't think I'm going to fall out of them because there's a door and a, and a piece of glass and so on. Same up tall buildings. But I don't like tall buildings. I wouldn't live in one. And I find, I think this is barometric in some way, if I go into the lift of a very tall building and say, press floor number 80, I know that I'm going high up, even though I can't see, I have no visual clue that I'm a long way above the ground. Something inside me tells me, and I go, I do get a sort of vertigo. I start to feel room spin. So I think there's, there is an undiscovered and unexplained aspect to the fear of heights that is something to do with air pressure, magnetic fields, something like that. The highest I've ever been above the Earth is 73,000 feet in a U-2 spy plane, so I have been pretty high. That's sort of twice as high as a normal airliner flies, and that's a long way up. And if you do fall out of a U-2 spy plane, you free fall for something like 18 minutes before your parachute opens, so you can actually exhaust your entire supply of oxygen by screaming on the way down, and then you suffocate before you get a chance to open your parachute and float perfectly safely to Earth. Now, of course, if you put a beam here of the same size, they were quite big beams, we would all happily sit on the edge and eat a sandwich. So some people say, well, it's exactly the same, why can't you just do it up at height? Because if you fall off from up there, you're killed, and if you fall off from here, you're not. It, that's all there is to it. It's a perfectly reasonable fear of dying. I don't know anybody who's scared of depths. In closed spaces, yes, but nobody's scared of going into a really deep valley because you can't fall up out of it and it's not going to fill itself in, is it? There's no danger from being deep down, but there is danger from being high up. That's why we don't like it. In fact, I think people who aren't scared of heights aren't to be trusted. Their judgment is clearly very, very ropey. It's not heroic or impressive. It's utter stupidity. That's not like not realising that matches are dangerous if you hold them under your eyeballs or something. It's, it's, it's utterly thick. Even animals realise that heights are dangerous. Are any birds scared of heights? I've often wondered that. If you're a bird and you are scared of heights, do write in. But yeah, selfie is quite good if you can if your arms are long enough and yeah. you've got the right sort of camera. I mean, most people do selfie on a mobile, yeah, like that. And it's, it's it's quite it's quite an art form doing a good selfie. It's not really it's, it's rubbish, but 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 there is a difference between a good one and a, and a mediocre one. Mm. Interestingly, because when I first worked in magazines and things, I spent a lot of time with photographers who still used film, usually transparency film. And one of them made a very good point, which is that when you're using film, you take a whole series of pictures. You would never take one, like in the old poof, flash bulb and powder days. You'd take a lot, so it would be a picture of a car or me doing something. And then they would develop them have them developed by a lab, then they would see what they'd actually got. And in the string of 10 pictures that showed me driving around a corner, say, they would say, that's the best one. They're all roughly the same, but that's the really good one. I'll use that one. But then in their archive, they have those other, they have those outtakes of history, this, this sort of unseen behind the wings of the stage bit. And that doesn't tend to happen with digital, because people delete them. So, which is probably just as well, otherwise the amount of history that would end up in the world would be unbearable. But there is, I mean, I think digital photography is great, but is it, now, old people, I'm sorry to keep going about being old, but I am not, now, old people get nostalgic for the wrong reasons, and they think life was better in the old days, but it wasn't. You used to go on holiday or whatever, take your photographs, and take the little canister down to, there wasn't happy snaps then, but there was boots, or whatever, and you'd have them developed. Then a week later, you'd go, oh, I've got to go and pick my pictures up, and you'd get the little packet, and you'd open, you'd go, oh, no, it's got the sticker on that says I have my finger over the lens, or whatever. And that was, I suppose, quite exciting, but actually it was rubbish, because sometimes they wouldn't come out at all. And you're much better off being able to look at it and say, yep, I've got that one. But I never take pictures. The only time I take pictures is if I see something amusing, like a funny sign or something. I might take a picture of it, but I don't, you know, if I see a great sunset or I go and look at a fantastic historic building like Scrada Familia or something, I don't take pictures of it because I can remember what it looks like and the be better pictures are in your head. I have fiddled around with Instagram because I know a lot of cameramen and photographers and so on, they're always fiddling around with it and mucking about it. It's, it's fascinating actually, but there's, it's a bit like digital reproduction of music. There comes a point where I think, well, what is actually true? 
I mean, photography has never really been true. It's a, it's a trick. Art is a trick, really. It makes you see something that isn't really there, obviously. But once you start, once you get music onto a CD or even pictures onto, say, a CD or a flashcard, it's a digital process which is, you know, data, just a stream of ones and noughts really, is fed into a machine which then knows how to interpret it to turn it back into the thing that was there originally, i.e. a picture of you or a selfie of me. But really, within that process, I could take a picture of you and that process could be designed to give me a picture of a dinosaur. I don't think there's anything dinosaur in there, but you know what I mean. It's the same with the music. I think, well, I could record that orchestra, but actually the decoding and then and then reassembling of that data could give me Stephen Fry reading a poem. Could, couldn't it?